Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the BSF Beyond the Bushel webinar. We're glad to have you join us here this morning. My name is Sean Haney, founder of realagriculture.com and host of Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio 147 Sirius XM. I'll be moderating this discussion today. It's great to be back aboard these BSF webinars. Joining us today, we, we got a great lineup of people to provide their perspective on what's happening in the the canola industry and the markets and weaving it all together as growers try to make better decisions for the 2022 growing season. Joining us will be Wes Petkow. He's a senior analyst of oil seed and vegetable oils with IHS Market, as well as his colleague, Peter Rohde. He is VP and head of client advisory and development at IHS Market. They're going to give us a, a really, really good deep breakdown into what's happening, not only just in the canola market, but the overall veg oil complex as well. And then we'll be joined by Garth Hodges. He is VP of North American Business Management Seeds with BSF, and as well, Janelle Delage, who farms in Indian Head, Saskatchewan. So a great lineup of people. And the best part is you'll be also able to ask your, your questions. No matter what each growing season brings, understanding canola commodity prices provides a better perspective on the canola market as a whole. And it provides helpful insight on planning rotations, managing risk, and building sustainability. And, and that's why we're devoting an entire webinar to this discussion here today. Today, our experts will cover a wide range of topics. We'll start by gaining a short and long-term perspective on acres and canola commodity prices. We'll look at what's changed in recent years for crushing capacity and what to watch for in the future. We'll hear about the impact of biodiesel on commodity prices in Canada, as well as renewable diesel as well. And finally, we'll discuss overall sustainability in the, the canola industry. We'd like to end this webinar today, as I mentioned, with your time with time for you to ask some questions and participate in the discussion today. To submit a question, just type it into the chat box uh, that'll appear on the screen. At the end of the discussion, we'll get to as many of those questions as we possibly can. Please also put your location in uh, next to your question to give us some some sort of context geographically where you're uh, where you're farming. Also, for those of you that are certified crop advisors or certified crop science consultants, you'll receive one CEU credit for attending this webinar here this morning. If you registered in an earlier date and forgot to include your numbers, don't worry. Be sure to contact Ag Solutions Customer Care at 877-371-BSF. That is 877-371-2273. Let's get started. Our first speakers are Wes Patkow and Peter Rohde. Wes is the Senior Analyst for Oilseed and Vegetable Oils with IHS Market. With over 20 years of experience, Wes' responsibilities include global oilseed, protein meal, and vegetable oil market analysis. He also has significant expertise on market supply, demand, trade, and price analysis of, a, of Canadian commodities from being employed at what was formerly the Canadian Wheat Board. And he holds a master's degree in agriculture economics, his colleague Peter is VP and head of client advisory and development of IHS Market, where he regularly provides market outlook insights for clients. Before joining IHS Market in 2016, Peter was a grain was a grain division and merchandising manager in Nebraska and a commodities manager for Poet Ethanol in South Dakota. He also spent 20 years with Cargill in various areas, including grain market risk management, procurement, and grain facility management. He also holds a bachelor's degree in agricultural economics. Wes and Peter, lead us off. It's over to you. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your time uh, today all and uh, look forward, really look forward to this. Uh, so as we uh, move forward here, Wes and I are going to uh, be talking for the next 15 minutes, going to be talking, showing you some slides and talking through the uh, supply and demand and price outlook of what we're seeing in the canola market. and. Uh, and Wes is uh, going to do a little bit of a deep dive into uh, the biofuels markets and the impacts of that biofuels market. But just giving you an idea of, so who are we at IHS Market? Uh, we have a, a really broad range of analysts and we cover the market really from uh, from upstream to midstream to downstream. And uh, and uh, and especially in the agriculture, agribusiness side, we're, we're farm to fork. Wes and I have, an, have a, the pleasure of working with our agribusiness group where we, we have a lot of uh, deep dive insights uh, from a wealth of analysts that, that we work with. But starting off, let's, I'm going to talk through a little bit of, about supply, demand and price and where we're at, what we're seeing. This, this uh, All commodities markets over the past year have 
have really seen some volatility and and uh, that uh, this this canola chart that's showing just simply just straight upward price movement over the past several months uh, that's that's very similar for many commodities markets but we've but we're seeing we've been seeing record canola prices and uh, and you know it, it ran up over it's up been up over a thousand dollars Canadian per ton for for a while now and and that's just uh, we've never seen type of prices at at this level. Um, some of the things that are driving that is, of course, the balance sheet. So this past year, uh, you know, so some of the numbers that I'm going to show you are our, IH, our, our IHS market projections. Uh, right now, the, you know, the 2021-22 crop, canola crop, came, uh, we're projecting that at 13 million tons. I mean, that came well, well, way down. It had really some, some droughty type issues. We recognize there's some other numbers out there. I think Stats Canada just came out with 12.6 million. However, um, we recognize Stats Canada will make a dip adjustments during different times of the year. And in fact, in uh, in next year, so in fact, this latest Stats Canada report actually adjusted the past three years worth of production. So, uh, but anyway, tight, tight uh, stocks on hand. Uh, with the uh, with the lower production number, but the, but our outlook as we're moving forward in 2022-23 is for planted area to be at record levels, record type of production is what we're projecting, assuming a normal type of uh, a, a normal type of weather situation, of course, and normal type of yields bouncing back to what is what is what is more of a normal range, what you would expect if we get some normal type weather, and stocks bouncing back however not nearly coming back as 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 far as where the what was considered normal in past years and this uh demand side is very strong and Wes is going to do a little bit of a dive into that but uh you can't really look at what's going on in canola without having an understanding of what's going on in the soybean and market uh, specifically looking at the u.s market uh the, our chart over to the right shows that uh, U.S. stocks on hand really are not as tight as what the previous outlook was a couple of months ago. Uh, that that carryout number for 2021 over 256 million bushels. Our projection for 21-22 carryout up over 350 million bushels uh, is not as tight, and so the price outlook is not nearly as bullish as previous. And in our price outlook. Uh, we show uh, looking approximately a year out, uh, what do we think in the trading range is going to be based on where the current market is? You know, we think that the market in the twelve and a half dollar futures range is about in the midway mid range of our trading outlook. I will tell you that a couple of months ago, the top end of our soybean trading range was about two dollars a bushel higher than what it currently is. But with the. Uh, with some of the uh, demand features with U.S. soybeans coming down and the stocks on the hand bumping up and the expect there's an expectation that planted area is going to bounce higher in uh, for the 2022 marketing year. And so we're uh, as we look out further, we're we're not bullish from current levels. But uh, Brazil, we also have to understand what's going on in Brazil. They are producing record setting production levels. Uh, we're expecting a record setting 145 million ton crop and record setting exports as well. So big, big uh, soybean crops there. But soybean oil has been a feature that has really take, stepped up and become the front of the soy complex focus over the past year. And all it, and a lot of it has to do with uh, the demand for the biofuels, biodiesel industry. And Wes will talk a little bit more deeper dive on that. But I. But these soybean oil prices uh, up in the 55 to 60 cent range uh, really are about twice what they were trading about a year ago. And uh, our expectation is, is that soybean oil is going to uh, continue to be strong because of that strong demand picture uh, in that marketplace. But when we're looking at canola, Canadian canola in particular, yes, planted area, had uh, bounced back here in 21-22. We're expecting the 2022-23 marketing year. We're projecting 9.5 million hectares. That's, you know, that's bouncing higher. Our previous outlook at one time was calling 9.2. Again, generally higher prices, 
a strong demand is in is sending the message to producers that uh, to maximize planted area, and that's what we're expecting. We have an outlook here for five years out, uh, taking a little bit of a step back, and and that's a little bit normal when you uh, when the market reacts, uh, producers react to high planted area, increasing production. Generally, that levels things out a little bit as we go forward, but there's certainly a lot of uncertainty there. Uh, on the global front, it's the same type of picture. The, the European Union is being encouraged to maximize planting area, that bumping up to 5.6 million hectares. Australia is encouraged to bounce their planted area higher, and in fact, Australia has been uh, the beneficiary of, of getting some exports out uh, because uh, the Canadian exports were were lower, but uh, and the and even though the the U.S. area isn't uh, huge compared to Canada, that's also expected to to take a bit of a bump higher. But uh, this demand picture is interesting. Uh, when we looked at uh, when we look at total use, we expect that number to continue to climb as far as Canadian canola use. But uh, when you compare crush to exports, what it's basically saying is. Where is most of the demand at? Is that internal for domestic usage on the crush side, or is it on the export side? In previous years, exports have been the largest demand picture. They've, they've come into even level, and here with the, with the production dropping and prices strong, uh, that domestic use has really stepped up, and that has everything to do with the, the demand from the, from the biofuels market. And so when you look at a price, you know, the common question is, what are prices going to do? Are they going to stay up in this uh, over $1,000 a ton range? And uh, our expectation, again, based on, based on that production level that we're expecting with record-setting production, now everything will have to do with weather and yield. But if indeed we get that type of production level, we... We do expect soy, uh, canola, excuse me, canola prices to be to stay elevated, but uh, we don't expect them to stay up in the thousand uh, dollar ton range. Uh, the current market is is inverted, but uh, but we don't expect you know the current market as we look out further out in 2022, um, we don't expect a huge amount of drop because there's going to be a lot of uncertainty and and uh, and the message uh, is going to show strong demand. And so we don't expect a huge amount of downside and prices will generally be elevated. But uh, with that, let me pass it on to Wes and he can dive into a little deeper on the veg oil side. Thanks, Peter. Uh, well, I want to pick up on what Peter's been talking about a little bit. He, he mentioned quite a bit about the uh, fundamentals for the seed, for canola seed, and how those were, uh, you know, the situation is tight right now, which which is a bullish scenario in the short term and in the, in the current year. I want to talk about a little bit uh, what I see happening uh, in the medium to longer term and how there may be a demand side uh, fundamental change that, that really supports the the price of uh, of, so of soybean oil, really all vegetable oils, but uh, soybean oil in particular, and, and and how that relates to canola. And I think uh, my first slide here, you know, kind of gives a pretty clear clear idea of what's been happening with global veg oils. Really, all the benchmark vegetable oil prices are, uh, you know, probably close to double, or you know, they've come off a little bit lately with a, a weaker energy prices and a situation with with uh, the COVID variant, but really still trading at very high levels relative to the lows in 2020. And uh, as, as, as you think about what's happening there, there's a number of things. Um, there's been the tight situation in palm oil, uh, but there's also, uh, there's also uh, an inflation trade that uh, really has made all commodities move higher. Uh, and in particular, we've noticed that the managed money has has extended their long position in uh, in uh, soybean oil. Um, so when we think about what's happened in vegetable oils, of course, that relates to canola. Canola, we uh, probably most of us know, understand that it's 45% uh, uh, or close to 45% uh, vegetable oil, which is uh, a, a scenario that uh, has always kept canola quite closely related and correlated to what's happening, particularly in really in all vegetable oils, they're all related, but particularly with the uh, US soybean oil futures. And that's what I'm showing on the left-hand side chart there. Uh, you can see that the, the prices move uh, generally uh, in a very cor close correlation and probably even closer than normal uh, in the last year. 
And with the prices of vegetables moving higher, we've also seen that uh, when you look at the, the value of canola being really the two crushed products, meal and oil, uh, the, the value of uh, the oil is now trading close to 80% of the value of, of, of canola um, in terms of the value of the total crush product. So. Um, that's a that's a scenario that's a support very supportive of crush margins and 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 supportive of the prices that uh, we're seeing right now for canola seed when you look at the demand coming from from the crush industry. Um, just if I can flip forward here, I, I think uh, whereas some of the supply issues, as Peter's already talked about, could be resolved with higher production, higher seed production, and more acreage coming back. Uh, there is this demand story that I want to focus on, uh, which is a fundamental uh, driver and, and something that's changing, and I think something that we have to keep an eye on going forward and think about going forward uh, as the the world is moving to lower carbon in in uh, motor fuels. There's a lot of focus right now on the United States and in North America, actually, and in Canada as well, uh, and, and that's all about uh, increasing. Uh, the production of renewable fuels longer term that'll include sustainable aviation fuel. Now, this is different than biodiesel. Um, I want to make that quite clear that this is not not the same as biodiesel. This is a new type of relatively new type of renewable fuel that energy companies are getting more and more involved in because they're they're incentivized by uh, subsidization out of different programs. Thinking mostly about the west coast of the U.S., uh, California has a I would call a low carbon fuel standard that incentivizes these energy companies to get more involved. And we're seeing these big uh, energy uh, majors get more involved in producing these fuels. And uh, and uh, right now we can see uh, what we have right now. This is separate from biodiesel again. Uh, there's about a billion uh, billion gallons of uh, production capacity online right now with a, about 14 plants uh, in the US and, and, and a little bit in Canada as well. But over the next, uh, two or three years we can see that going up by about uh, probably four to five fold and we'll end up with uh, capacity probably somewhere near four or five million billion gallons of production and, and as that as that occurs uh, there's more and more demand for feedstocks and, and the feedstocks uh, are the same ones that uh, a lot of the same ones that are used for producing biodiesel, but we're just increasing competition for all those different feedstocks. And right now, if I, uh, if I look at the chart on the left, that's a global picture of uh, the supply of feedstocks available. Uh, most of that is vegetable oil, about 85% of, of the world's feedstock uh, available for producing these fuels is veg vegetable oil. About 15% is uh, used cooking oil and, and things like that, and, and tallow, animal fats. Um, and, they, and really the animal fats and the tallow and, and used cooking oil are more desirable because they uh, are viewed as uh, having a lower carbon intensity and, and therefore meeting the goals of these new uh, LCFS. When I say LCFS, I mean low carbon fuel standard uh, policies. They're, they're more desirable, but really uh, to, to uh, achieve the production that is projected, it's, it's vegetable oils. The pressure is on vegetable oil to uh, meet the demand. And that is uh, creating this linkage that we, we have uh, increasing between energy, major energy companies and ag, ag producers. Um, so as we as we go forward and think about the importance of vegetable oil, you got to think about palm oil. Uh, it's the biggest uh, category globally uh, for vegetable oil production, but uh, the problem there is, uh, as far as uh, these low carbon fuel standards programs around the world, and particularly in California, uh, it, it's a non-starter. Palm oil is not viewed as a sustainable alternative, and, and it can't be considered. Uh, you can consider some of the palm byproducts, but but palm oil is not something that can be used to produce these uh, low these new uh, renewable fuels going forward. Um, and that's a problem because on a on a, on a land or uh, per unit of land basis, it, Palm is the, the largest producer. And uh, notably though, go, if you look at the other alternatives on the right there, rapeseed and canola is, is the second. So uh, that puts a lot of focus on what we're talking about today. Um, so what we what we foresee see going forward, and we have uh, a lot of people working on our consulting teams, working with energy companies, working with ag companies, looking at how uh, how how this is going to be resolved going forward. Uh, what we see developing is a what we call a feedstock gap, and uh, the 
dashed line that I have on the top of this chart is just the capacity uh, going forward and, and the production uh, capable, the possible production of renewables going forward, and then the amount of renewables you could produce using the different alt the different feedstocks available. You can see that the the in the U.S. right now about 50% of the biofuels produced is are being done using uh, being done using soybean oil. Uh, and then you have some of the other alternatives, but uh, at, at this point, it's 50% uh, uh, soybean oil, which uh, we only anticipate is going to uh, create more upward uh, support for, for vegetable oil going forward. Um, as far as canola, uh, right now, I think we can already start to see some of the impact of this, uh, the, what's happening, uh, influencing the market for, for, for canola. Um, uh, typically, about uh, two thirds of the canola oil is exported. It typically, it's and most of that is going to either China or the U.S. I think even in the last few months, I can see that uh, more canola oil is is being rationed away from uh, export uh, out of North America and is going towards uh, uh, the U.S. And we expect that that's going to continue as we go along. And and it may not be directly into the biofuels, but it could and will quite likely be to replace soybean oil and uh, uh, soybean oil that's not uh, available to the food industry going forward. So uh, very bullish story for canola in terms of the demand side as, as, as far as we look at it in terms of uh, biofuel production. Um, what that's doing is driving uh, more opportunity, more incentive to increase crush in North America, not only for soybeans, but also for canola. Uh, the oil shares for soybeans are also strong, like I'd already talked about for canola, and uh, we're really uh, uh, incentivizing more crush. And I, I think it's it could be a little bit uh, um, somewhat deceiving if you're looking at just the board margins. Uh, a lot of people probably on this call look at the board margins for crushing. Uh, I would uh, I would want to make the point that the crush margins are much better than the board margins because the uh, uh, the price of, of cash traded canola oil or soybean oil is is much stronger than what the the uh, futures contract calculations for board margins would indicate. And uh, as we go forward here, I think uh, we're anticipating that uh, by say 2025, you're going to see uh, uh, probably a 12 to 15 percent increase in uh, soybean crush, uh, but uh, crush capacity. But when we look at uh, what's been announced and what's happening in Western Canada, we're going to see more like a 50 percent increase in canola crushing, and uh, uh, that's that's all because of uh, primarily uh, because of what what we're talking about here with vegetable oil and the opportunity that the crushers are seeing. So I think with that, I will turn it back to our next speaker. Hey, thanks a lot, Wes and Peter. Really, really do appreciate that. There's a lot to digest there. I know I wrote myself uh, about a full page of questions. So we'll, we're going to get to the Q&A with Peter and Wes here at the back end of the program. But first, I want to bring in our next guests, uh, Garth Hodges and Janelle, Janelle Delage. Garth is VP of North American Business Management Seeds with BSF, born and educated in South Africa with an early introduction to a multi-crop agricultural environment, plus several years of international experience in seeds and crop protection. Garth has over 30 years of activity in various disciplines of agricultural business. Joining him will be Jan Janelle Delage. She manages the business operations and acts as lead agronomist on a 30,000 acre farm in Indian Head, Saskatchewan, where of course they grow canola, wheat, lentils, and peas. Janelle and Garth, uh, welcome to the webinar. Thank you very much, Sean. Thank you. It's great to see both of you. So um, I, I got a number of questions that we're going to kind of go back and forth here and build off of what we just heard there from from Wes and, and Peter. Garth, I'll, I'll start with you. Speaking from a, a life science company, a seed supplier perspective, how do you think companies should be addressing some of the optimism around high commodity prices, specifically canola and soybeans that we just heard there from Peter and Wes? Great, thanks, Sean. Yes, I think firstly, um, it's about time um, and and also well-deserved to the growers. I, I, I get a sense that it's, it's almost like society is saying thank you to growers for all the hard work uh, that, they, that they put in. And, uh, and I think this is, uh, this is a really unique uh, opportunity for all of us. But for the life science companies, I would say it's really important that we use this momentum 
for investment in innovation. You know, from what we've heard from Peter and Wes, it seems like this is relatively stable. And when you talk about innovation, you're obviously thinking about the investment today. You know, we'll only be able to see that in maybe three or five years time. However, I do believe that this kind of events uh, in our commodities should really be harnessed and be used uh, for, uh, for investment uh, in innovation. You know, canola is not the largest crop in the world. And um, we know there's a favorite child out there called corn. And uh, corn does receive a lot of attention and, uh, and a lot of investment. And uh, sometimes I would say that uh, being in the canola business, you, you really do feel like that, uh, that last born child where it, uh, it seems that there's someone else that, uh, that, gets, uh, that gets all the attention. Nonetheless, I think for me, the commodity prices right now are something that has to fuel investment in innovation. Thanks a lot, Garth. Yeah, it's uh, the. I love that comment. It's about time. I I, I like that's a that's a very succinct way to put it. So Janelle, when you hear about this demand, you know, and canola over a thousand dollars, we may see it trace back to like I think the chart said eight thirty five that Peter showed. Does any of this hype change what you intend to possibly seed on your farm in, in 22? So it hasn't made a whole bunch of change for us because the the exciting thing, Sean, is it's not just canola, right? Wheat has also moved up. Lentils and peas have moved up as well. So for us, it, it hasn't really changed. We um, are going to continue to focus on what we're good at and, um, you know, make sure that we keep on with those practices that have made us successful up until now. And, you know, what whatever that may be using the best technology fundamental agronomy and then just relying on our great people and and you know what what we're doing is we're taking some bites of these good prices because it, it is exciting so trying to offset some fertilizer prices and and taking some bites of the new crop prices that are out there right now because um fertilizer is a big expense and we want to make sure that we that we have that covered because i feel like you know based on peter and wes's presentation and things we've been hearing there's optimism for 22 but there's also optimism going forward and and we don't want to uh to be short-sighted so janelle how do you take some of those bites from a pricing perspective with you know the dry bias uh you're, you're not exactly in a super super wet area in indian head so how do you approach that? Yeah, I mean, so for us, it's been smaller bites than usual. Don't get me wrong. They're, they're yeah. definitely smaller bites than they have been historically, but we're still doing it, right? I mean, um, taking a, a, a pretty broad approach to what's happening, how they the prices look, what's happening globally. And then, I mean, we spend a lot of time then developing local relationships as well and making sure that, um, we then utilize some of that regional knowledge as well. So yeah, there's smaller bites, but um, it, it is something we've been putting some sales on the books to to cover and make sure that we are capturing some of these good prices. And, and, and Janelle, I just want to follow up on that. We we heard from Wes and Peter there. You know, they they could probably give us an eight hour breakdown of what's going on. That was that was just sort of like a bit of a sliver knowing those guys. Um, how do you manage your marketing intel? Because I find for myself as try, you know, somebody that tries to cover it on a daily basis with real agriculture, it's, it's like a fire hose. Like there's, it's just, it comes at you and you just try to pick away at it. How do you, how do you manage it? Yeah, so we've found some, you know, some trusted advisors and some trusted sources that give us I would say some varying degrees of perspective. So, you know, subscribe to some that give a, a fairly global perspective so that we understand what's going on, you know, around the world and what impact that can have on us. Because, you know, as we all know, we uh, we do a lot of exporting and, and it depends, you know, it's really important to know what's happening in the rest of the world. So that's that's a big part. We've, we've found some people that we can trust, that we, we get their opinion and, uh, let them help us sort through the information that's going to have the biggest impact on our farm. And then I would say the other big one is um, yeah, just the relationships that we've developed with our local elevators, salespeople, buyers, that kind of thing, because 
you know, th they'll help us get the rest of the way there with the logistics and the timing and that sort of thing. Yeah, it, it's a, I think it's a task that farmers, th you just try to be as good as you can at it. You try to improve. Uh, it is, uh, nobody's perfect. And so it's, uh, especially these volatile times too. I, I think it's a, re it's a real challenge as growers try to steer through it because it is such a global industry. It's not just about what's going on in your local market. It's also about, you know, around the world. What's the crop in Brazil? What's going on? Yeah, it's just, it's, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's heavy. Uh, Garth, I want to talk about sustainability. Canola has a great sustainability story, but, and there's a but here, do you think the canola industry should be concerned at all about how positive commodity prices could lead to, you know, an even higher jump in, in terms of canola acres? And what does that do about canola's sustainability story? Because obviously there's only so much land, we gotta, that, would, that would basically result in a tightening of margins even more. Or... Um, tightening of rotations even more, sorry. Yeah, Sean, you're right. Uh, certainly, uh, this is both exciting and, and there is some, uh, there's some concern. I, I, I would say that um, my concern is somewhat tempered by the resilience and, uh, you know, of growers. So I think I just put that there. The concern is uh, primarily, you know, we're now more than 10 years um, where we are in excess of 18 million acres. So actually, this phenomenon now of maybe going one or two million acres more um, is a concern. Sure, the rotations are tightening, but probably what's more of a concern is the fact that this is around about our tenth year now that we that we have uh, you know more than eighteen million acres. And, and what is the concern? The concern is really around the tightening of rotations will cause us to have an increase in certain diseases. Some diseases that we hadn't seen very prevalent in the past, you know, will start uh, resurging. Um, and, you know, these are some things like the verticilliums and the sclerotinia, some of the, the diseases that we don't see very often. However, the other part is, you know, it's a, it's a race um, between the breeders and, and disease, like whether it's black leg, different races of black leg or different races of club root. And, and this race is there, and the question is, you know, who's gonna who's gonna win? But but I do believe that you know that is primarily the concern, the concern of how our growers and ourselves and breeders and the rest of the advisors going to be part of this resilience of the of the industry, because in that resilience of us all doing things together that are right in agriculture, right for agronomy, I I think you know that resilience is going to help us, but without that. I think there is a definite concern and you know there will be growers that are thinking about sustainability and the sustainability of the future but I, I think you know what is a concern is maybe those that don't view it that way and you know mother nature is not that forgiving and you know maybe we can talk about that just now but yes it's both exciting and concerning but uh, I do believe in the resilience of uh, growers as well. Garth, I'm old enough to remember, and you'll remember it too, when canola was like at 12 million acres, you know, there was all this talk about it, 15, there's there's no way canola will ever be over 15 million acres, and uh, yeah, we, we proved that one wrong uh, quite easily, uh, as a matter of fact. So, what, Garth, what are some of the things that the canola industry has to do to ensure that 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 long-term uh, showcase and commitment to things, something like sustainability so that we don't, uh, I guess, wreck it for ourselves is, is maybe the best way to put it. Yeah, no, and I, and I think, uh, first of all, we're going to look at this as a partnership. This is not just one element of the industry that's suddenly going to have a, a, a silver bullet and going to be able to solve it. I really do see this as a, as a partnership and every one of us, you know, working together to resolve it. And, and Janelle mentioned, you know, agronomy and just how important agronomy is. Uh, also mentioned fertilizer prices and you know there's some other in not only the prices influencing it but yes you know the the whole thing about uh, about carbon and carbon sequestration and you know there's there's different forces out there not only mother nature that we have to deal with but I, I think concretely um, it's going to be all down to agronomy and and how we manage through that so if I think of the disease as, as part the collaboration has got to be yes we as a seed industry, we're as, uh, we are going to be innovative and we are going to make investments in disease breeding. That has to happen and that will happen. And these commodity prices, of course, are giving us a lot of incentive to do that. Additionally, it's the, 
it's the collaboration, the agronomy the research that we have to do as a, as a company. And we do invest a lot in agronomy research. And then I think the other part of it is, it is about if we're going to have, we know we're going to have short rotations. And it's going to be a matter of how do we break that disease cycle, whether we manage the volunteers or, you know, whether we make certain that we take, take care of canola during the, during the off season, and as well as planting varieties that, you know, do have uh, resistance. Now, one thing that I think Mother Nature did share with us a little bit in these last years with the dryness, I think she did give us a little bit of a break. And so, unfortunately, dry years do have low yields and, our, and, and Dry, year, dry years are not very nice to have, but what it has happened, it has maybe taken the edge off uh, some of the diseases, you know, as well. So collaboration, working together, and really understanding the different forces. There's a force of nature, there's a force of coming at us from, you know, fertilizer uh, usage, and uh, it is going to be agronomy and doing things together that's going to take us through. And Janelle, that's a good point that Garth makes. It, sort of the deep breath uh, that this sort of maybe allows. Think about peas, right? There was a lot of people backing off of peas because of the the challenges with root rot. Not not that we were super concerned about too much peas in the rotation based on the levels they were at, but root rot it really really hurt yields and therefore acres kind of were, were challenged. So there there probably is some truth to that. Yeah, absolutely. These these dry years have, I mean, have helped in that regard. But and and a lot of it though is the decisions that we make as well, right? Switching up varieties with different disease packages, making sure that you know we're planting varieties with different black leg um, resistance, um, thinking about club root proactively before it's you know a problem on our farm. You know we've introduced those varieties on our farm long before there's been any concern of club root, and and thinking about the rotation overall because we were talking about you know um, root rot. You know you're talking about aphanomyces, but then there's there's also just root rot, fusarium root rot as well that's proving to be a bit of a challenge also. And and looking back and seeing how that plays through the rotation and choosing canola varieties and other varieties of the other crops we grow in rotation that that will help with that because you know some of the dry years you actually see those show up more which which can be a bit of a challenge and and thinking about the insects too like what how do the cutworms what does that look like through the rotation because they're a challenge in the lentils and the canola so um yeah there's there's a lot to do with 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 the agronomy to make sure that we're uh, planning as good as we can to keep canola sustainable and all the other crops as well. Yeah, and pr probably the the saver here is the fact that, like you mentioned, Janelle, prices are good all around. Like, tr try to find a crop in the Western Canadian rotation that doesn't pencil out to be, you know, realistically pretty good. I I, I can't think of one. There, maybe if there was, maybe uh, Peter West could help us if they have some of those charts. But I, it's it, they're all pretty good across the board. So that is allowing people to kind of maybe stay committed to their their longer term rotation. So uh, Janelle, how do you balance this opportunity between canola prices and some of the input costs like high fertilizer? that has uh, gained a, a lot of attention here and very, very readily. So uh, how does this influence some of your decisions on the rotation? Um, so to be honest, it hasn't changed them, but it changes what we do, right? So we've you know, spent a lot of time soil testing, seeing what, what's there, what's left from the crop that we grew. Um, you know, but like I said, it changes how we market ahead, you know, even in slightly uncertain term, uncertain times with how much moisture and how much we're going to produce to offset that. Um, but it doesn't change our rotation, right? We're still, we're still sticking to what we know how to grow best because, you know, I don't think it's a year to try to, you know, hit one out of the park. It's, it's a year to try to, to make sure that we, uh, focus on what we do well and do a really good job of it because we still have to grow the crop at the end of the day, right? Commodity prices can be good, but we still have to grow the crop at the end of the day. So we uh, we manage our risk by doing that, knowing what we know how to do well and doing a good job of it. Yeah, Garth, I, I want to go back to some of the stuff. But Janelle was just talking about some of the diseases and insects and things like that. And a lot of times varieties get the attention. Everybody has their favorite variety and we can list off the numbers, um, but it, it, there's the variety and then there's the, the trait 
that really defends the that variety from some of the things that are trying to attack it. Talk, talk about trying to put that package together to, you know, it goes together, it's in the bag, and uh, growers see the benefit. Just the, the process to make that all happen, from an especially from an investment standpoint. Yeah, no, certainly. I mean, the first thing is it's all about, it all takes time. So like we said, you know, there's anywhere between five and sometimes even 10 years uh, between when the, the trait is really found and then it finally reaches growers. I mean, if I just think of pod chatter, you know, that, that, that was an excess of 10 years of in, in development and research. And it was really, really hard to get it just right. You know, it was very much like a, a Goldilocks uh, experience. You know, it was either too strong and you couldn't get the you couldn't get the pods to open or it was too weak. Uh, but, you know, finally, after all the years, it, it was just right. So there are certain traits uh, like the pod shadow trait that once you get it just right, you know, and it's in the in the seed, of course, you can keep it there for a very long time because it's it's part of it's the intrinsic part of your breeding program. I just think right the way back, you know, we're celebrating our 25 year anniversary of Invigor um, and thinking right back into the beginning, it really was a, a technology that inspired um, with hybridization. And so the hybridization technology, of course, has been there for all those 25 years. And that's been the inspiration of, you know, for Invigor. Now, if you think of herbicide tolerance, you know, once it's perfected, it's there for a very long time. The reason I want to make that distinction, Sean, is that the everything else, the all the other traits that are put into breeding, these are almost evolutionary. It's trying to keep up with Mother Nature or even trying to not only keep up, but try to exceed it. And so when you think of breeding, it's really something where we look at and say, you know, what will happen three years down the line? What will happen five? What will happen 10? And, and that's where the breeders then are slowly trying to introduce all these really good native traits um, into, the, uh, into the material. So when you think of your favorite hybrid, <laughs> of your favorite variety, unfortunately, Mother Nature says, you know what, I'm not going to keep it your favorite forever. <laughs> and uh, it's actually the variety or the hybrid uh, is the one where Mother Nature says, enough's enough. You know, you've just had enough and we've got to bring in the new one and then the next new one. And so it's not so much of I've got a favorite, I'm going to be a favorite, but it's really the breeders are saying, we know what is going to be important in three years time. We know what's going to be important in five and in 10. And they've got to start that many years before to start introducing some of these features that growers are going to experience uh, later on. So this time lag is the part that I think we need understand we're thinking about the future whatever janelle has on her farm today was already invented five or ten years ago and you mentioned the time to put it all together that's why a lot of people are really excited about things like crispr in the future to try to shrink some of those times and there's always talk about regulatory reform in countries like canada all all of that fits into into that narrative uh, Janelle, another agronomic issue that I, I would say when I, when I think about our real ag radio call in line, the the topic that maybe outside of fertilizer that's gotten the most attention is herbicide carryover. H how have you managed this issue in such a, a, a dry bias of time? So thankfully for us, we received quite a bit of rain in August. So that's that's going to help our situation for next year. But I know that not everyone's in that same scenario, and that they've been you know put in a in a tough situation because um, you know some labels changed after the season. So that's that's definitely put them in a in a big in a big challenge. Um, so I mean, all I can say is you know we we are able to go ahead because of our our rain and after season moisture situation with you know, without a whole bunch of risk of carryover. And, and when I'm when I'm planning, I'm very conscientious of herbicide carryover concerns, um, just because of, you know, we grow lentils and have some sensitive crops in our rotation. Um, but what, you know, what I would what I would say is that it, it is real. I mean, I, I've, I've seen it. I've been, you know, as an agronomist for a lot of years and, and have seen it and know that it is definitely something to be very cautious of. And and uh, these these dry dry conditions are you know unprecedented and it it will definitely be a challenge. So it's uh, it's a it's a tricky one without question. And every scenario and every soil and every you know 
you know, inch of rain makes a difference in these kind of cases. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Garth, we were just talking about investment varieties, traits. Uh, I'm curious, I, I like to ask machinery manufacturers this question about how, how growers participate in influencing companies uh, like some of the manufacturers on on the, the technologies and what they do with some of their equipment. But this can also be the same when it comes to something like a seed company. How, how, do, how do you take in grower feedback to try to make sure you're staying ahead of Mother Nature as you described it? Yeah, very much, uh, very much so. I mean, we're we're very close to the growers, and uh, you know, one of the one of the really neat things about being in the seed business is that you actually get to live the grower's life as well. And uh, I know Janelle is smiling because she realizes that uh, one of the big questions out there is, you know, are you going to have enough seed? Because as much as the as much as the growers have experienced a drought and have experienced a lower yield, uh, you know, so have we. Um, so, you know, not only do we listen to growers, but we also live the growers' experiences as well. And uh, and even in our breeding, uh, we do have breeding trials all around, um, you know, all around Canada and in, and in growers' fields. And uh, so from that point of view, not only do we listen, but we also experience what they're experiencing. But I think what, one of the important things here is that, you know, not only listening to growers, but also listening to the industry. You know, Wes and Peter are speaking about, you know, the, the biofuel industry. A number of years uh, ago, we were listening to the food industry and the food industry was telling us all about trans fatty acids and was sharing that there's a, you know, there's a desire to lower the saturate uh, levels. There's a desire to have oils that have, uh, that can be used in specialty uh, frying, so healthy frying oils. And, and from, as a result of that, we introduced in bigger health. So, you know, I always say, you know, is there a plural to canola? Uh, there's not only one canola out there. So you can see there that to growers, we're living the growers experience and we're listening to the industry and we're trying to understand what's gonna be really great for the future and what can we do to prepare for that? So from that point of view, we do have, you know, in bigger health, uh, we do have our bigger classic, we're living the growers experience with regards to uh, environmental conditions. And also obviously right now, our big uh, investment is in disease breeding. So I think from that point of view, not only do you try to predict what the future is gonna be, but you try to enable the future. So whatever you think the future could be, it's about enabling it. Because if we don't think about it today, if there's that time lag, we certainly have to not only predict, not only listen to people like Wes and Peter, not only listen to viewers, to enable the future so that when the future arrives, we can be ready for it. Yeah, thinking about something in hindsight, you've, you're already, you should be focused on the next thing. Uh, it, it's hard to go backwards. So very, very good point. We're going to get to Wes and Peter just in a second with our Q&A. I got one more question for each of you. Janelle, quickly, right now as a, as a farmer, an agronomist, ma trying to manage those 30,000 acres, what keeps you up at night? Um, so, I mean, some of the things are inflation and, and interest rate hikes are, are a concern for us that can have a big impact on the bottom line of our business. And uh, the other one is just the some of the supply chain issues and what does that mean for the spring, you know, everything from equipment parts to chemistry to all those things. So those, those are probably the things that keep me up at night the most is just thinking about the impact to, those, to our business and, and how do we mitigate the risk and what steps we need to be taking to make sure that, um, you know, we can control as, as much as we can. Yeah, those are big, you know, something like inflation big issue you know what impacts you but like you said it's out of your control it's trying, it's trying to figure out what can i do to help mitigate my risk yeah. and my exposure to it garth from bsf's exactly. perspective what keeps you up at night maybe right now a bit of excitement i think keeps me up at night <laughs> can't wait for the uh, can't wait for the next season to start you know can you imagine with uh, with these uh, this environment can you imagine if we uh, if we have a nice uh, moist wet spring uh, so yeah, I guess uh, that to me that's just can't get can't wait to get out there and uh, and and see the spring uh, spring arrive. Um, but we know there's a winter in between. 
and, uh, and, and, and there are some concerns. I think the concern is, you know, how do we get the message out to growers that this is a partnership of how we're going to address some of these challenges? And, you know, maybe, maybe it's webinars like these and opportunities like these, and maybe it's the winter months that we can use to get the message out there. We're in this together. Um, it is about the volunteer management. It is about understanding that uh, we are going to have to face some challenges, uh, you know, in the future. Uh, seed production, I, I think it's a, uh, this is something that keeps us awake as well. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot, of, a lot of competition for crops in our irrigated production areas. And uh, to be frank, you know, some, some things happen that maybe reduces our ability or reduces the area where we can do seed production. It was wonderful news just the other day to hear about the investment in Southern Alberta uh, for additional irrigation acres. So things like that, are really good news. At the same time, I think for me, this you know, seed production is, uh, is, is important. Just any big disruption, you know, somebody making a mistake and, and disrupting the industry and, you know, recalls, you know, these are certainly things that uh, we, uh, we don't want to, we don't want to have uh, happen. And then I think lastly, it is about just how to really impress on everyone the importance of plant breeding and uh, the investment that needs to go into plant breeding and to making the, the products available for us in the future. But most of all, I just can't wait for the winter to be over and for us to have a nice spring and enjoy the fruits of all our hard work. Yeah, well, we try to stay ahead of Mother Nature. I wish she would, you know, oblige us with some uh, some moisture so we don't have to deal with some of the conditions we dealt with in 21 for sure. Okay, let's bring in Wes and Peter back into this discussion. We've got the whole, all of our guests, all of the panel here in one place. If you do have a question for any of our panelists, make sure you uh, address them specifically in your Q&A in the box. And uh, if you can, please put your location as well. It'll be much, much appreciated. Uh, I'm going to go over to Wes. Uh, Wes, you showed uh, a, 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 a picture there of all of the, the, the plant, the crush capacity in place, uh, the, the intended crush capacity expansion. One thing I've heard from some analysts is that they don't actually believe that all these plants, specifically in the Canadian market, are actually going to get built. Uh, do, do, Wes, do, what do you think? Do, do you think we're going to see a completion of all these intended uh, crush builds? You're muted there, Wes. Are you there, Wes? Oh, I'm talking. Wes, just, Can you hear there me? There you go. No, you're unmuted. Good. There you are. Oh, I wouldn't debate that very strongly. Like, I mean, that's all going to depend on what happens with the, the margins and the prices going forward, and there are risks. Uh, even with what I've talked about in, in terms of biofuels, we, we can see... Uh, really around the world that the policies can be changed and they do change and the, the politics changes and things. Uh, there are risks to uh, what could have happened. And then there's also, uh, you know, always got to think about the, the margins that are available right now. I, I mentioned that the crush margins are better than what you might uh, look at if you're looking at board crush margin calculations. But, um, you know, it'll all depend on, on how things play out going forward. Um, I think it's probably... Uh, there was a lot of optimism very early on, uh, even in the last few months, when the prices were rallying, and, and I mentioned funds getting a long, uh, long vegetable, thinking about soybean oil in particular, and, and that was uh, looking very optimistic as far as the, the build out and the scenario. But I, I think we're just getting started on on the the uh, the LCFS policies that I'm talking about. If it, this is the very early uh, innings there, and especially when I think about things like sustainable aviation fuel. So uh, I think over time, we do see that that a lot of the crush capacity does end up uh, being built. And, and uh, like I had mentioned, uh, the bias would be towards canola uh, because of the oil content, uh, uh, at least on a percentage basis. I, I had mentioned that the, the build out for soybeans was uh, say 12 to 15% over the next uh, five years, but uh, canola, the, the, the capacity increase was much larger at 50%. Um, I mean, that's not talking about absolute terms, but in, in percentage over what we have right now. So uh, yeah. I think that's the way I would uh, I would leave it for, for what I know right yeah. now. 
No, great, great insight. So, so Peter, one of the things that I've heard a lot from growers when we think about the clean fuel standard here in Canada and some of the legislated things that are happening in, in states like California that are really, really pushing this potential demand for renewable diesel is we're legislating demand. And so then it's not long term, it's not sustainable because legislation can change. The RFS in the, U, in the U.S. when it comes to corn-based ethanol it, it legislated demand, and it's uh, it's 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 always a hot political potato, especially in in 2023 when when the levels are renegotiated. Uh, what what do you think about this? Some of the growers' perspective on it's legislated demand. It's not long term. It's just it's not it, it's just it's it's not actually like pulling. We're pushing instead yeah. of pulling. Yeah, I certainly feels that way. You, uh, you're. Your comment reminded me of back when I was a commodities manager for the largest ethanol producer in the, in the U.S., and it kind of felt like at any given moment, uh, any political decision can make your can just kill your business in a hurry, is what it kind of felt like. But that's been it's felt that way since 2006, and it hasn't gone away. And so, uh, you know, the the demand has stayed in place. Uh, now, it, it does take a lot of, uh, uh, you know, it takes political lobbyists, uh, you know, I'll be honest about that to to continue to dr drive that business. But this is different that we're seeing in the biofuels side or bio, the renewable diesel side and the demand for canola in, for that. I, I think this is different. I think it's more sustainable. And I think even if it's, you know the current administ U.S. administration and Canadian administration are you know pro biofuels and they want to be the uh, you know a green focused administration. But I think every administration, no matter what, going forward will uh, will be in that camp. And so I, I don't think this is just uh, going to die on the next uh, political decision. Okay, great insight, guys. Really do appreciate it. We got a question here. Uh, I'm going to throw it to Garth. It has to do with flea beetles. So, Garth, flea beetle pressure was a major concern this past spring. There are differences in how effective treatments are. What is BSF doing to bring a higher level of control into its line of canola hybrids on flea beetles? Yeah, certainly. So, I mean, clearly, uh, flea beetles are are a major concern, and you know, we have these waves coming in. You know, some years higher, some years low. Um, you know, and yeah, we're uh, we're trying to make certain that we always have the best seed treatment um, on our uh, on our seeds, and um, and it's just a matter of trying to you know go out and uh, and find it, negotiate it, and buy it, and uh, and get it on our seeds. So we we really do realize the importance of uh, providing growers the very very best uh, you know protection uh, for our for our genetics, and so. Uh, we are trying our best to make certain that uh, we have the best material, the best seed treatment on our seeds. And then, of course, from that point onwards, it's uh, it's the management thereof. And, um, you know, some years it's going to be really, really severe and other years not so severe. And it's all about monitoring and, uh, and making certain that we, you know, we have we respray. But but all that said, flea beetles, uh, like diseases, are something that's going to be cyclical um but it is something that is really part of our mid to long-term investment and uh, i can share with you that uh, we do understand the importance and uh, that once again is one of the areas that we want to innovate for ourselves as well a nice warm spring would help us when it comes to flea beetle pressure as well you know lack of frost things like that for for sure janelle a question here for you it has to do with risk uh, risk management when it comes to the market. You mentioned you were sort of you were picking away uh, maybe smaller chunks than you would have in past years, but are you using put options to secure some new crop prices without delivery commitments? Oh, no, not at this moment. Not to say we haven't been talking about it and throwing around the ideas and it was a point of discussion, you know, just yesterday. <laughs> so, um, no, because at this point we still do need delivery, right? I mean, because if we do grow the crop, we need the bin space. We the logistics still are there, and and I feel like optimistically we're, we're hoping to grow the crop and do those kinds of things. So at this point, no, it it is really just a a play to 
uh, secure some delivery, secure some good prices so that we, you know, when we do grow the big crop, we, we don't have in space concerns and things like that. So uh, don't get me wrong. We've been talking about it and looking at it, but haven't, haven't pulled the trigger on anything with that regard yet. Hey, Sean, yeah. if you don't mind, let me chime ahead, in here. Yeah, and I'm, I'm interested, you know, uh, you know, canola futures are trading over a thousand dollars in the front month and it, and it makes you feel like the $765 in the Nov 22 is cheap, but that's that's a record high. You know, you, you have to go back. Well, you've never seen it higher than that. There was a bump up in 2008. So my question, I'm interested, Janelle, are you forward to contracting some 2022 crop at, you know, $765 Nov 22 futures? Yeah, we are. Oh, okay. Because you, I mean, I mean it just feel like I have to. You know, why do you say that like you're embarrassed? Like, uh, <laughs> it's okay. I'm not. And I've been picking away because we've been doing significantly smaller contracts. So we picked away. We sold some at 17, some at 18, some at 19 dollars. So yeah, we've been we've been picking away at it with these little contracts that I, you know, worry are going to be a pain come harvest. But yeah, we have been doing it. $17, well, I think, I think, $17 is cheap. Go ahead, Wes. Well, yeah. I think you have to look at a few things when you're thinking about the, the canola price. And I, I've been outlining this bullish story based on the on the, the renewable fuel build out. But at the same time, there is this record crop of Brazilian soybeans coming and there's a big seasonality in palm oil prices. Um, and we would anticipate going forward that uh, a lot of these worker problems that, uh, that have caused some of the tightness in Malaysian palm oil will get resolved, right? I mean, we've got the variant uh, problem again. Uh, but over time, that that that's probably... Uh, uh, I would think going to be resolved and you would get uh, often in the early part of the the calendar year, you do get a seasonal pressure in palm prices and, and palm is really the floor uh, even for uh, uh, all of these vegetable oils. But I do think though uh, longer term because of again, the sustainability issues and the renewable um, build out that favors uh, different oils, I'm thinking primarily about soybean oil, you probably get spreads widening out again uh, Earlier, we'd seen almost unprecedented uh, widespreads between uh, the other vegetables, thinking soybean oil, canola oil, and palm oil. And that's tightened up with the tight uh, supply of palm, but it probably uh, widens out again. But the, and, that, and that supports the oil share, but the oil share can be strong even though the seed price, even with the lower seed price. So uh, there's a lot of things to consider and a lot of moving parts going forward. Yeah. Garth, earlier you said that the food industry kind of led where you went with Invigor Health. Is the biofuel industry now leading you in terms of uh, what kind of characteristics some of your hybrids will have in the future? Yeah, absolutely, uh, Sean. So you know, we we do see that there's a little bit of uh, a little bit of roadway, a little bit of length and breadth in the in the in the biofuel industry. And uh, we've actually been working on, um, you know, canola quality juncea for a very long time. Uh, it's not it's not that easy, uh, but we have made some breakthroughs uh, recently. Uh, and once again, I don't want to leave the impression that suddenly next year it's going to be all uh, all there. But but I did want to mention that you know in this particular instance, uh, if we think about the crush plants around Regina, for example, absolutely yes, uh, we have stepped up our investment in testing both our Invigor canola, so our regular uh, Invigor uh, uh, Brassica napus, as well as we're going to start testing some of our um, canola quality juncea in that area as well. The same thing goes for the US. So as we look at the, um, the Invigor Health, of course, we believe that Invigor Health, uh, that whole uh, uh, high stability oils are going to be a premium oil that uh, should be in the in the mix for the future just to balance things out a little bit um, but uh, at the same time absolutely our R&D focus um, has broadened uh, as a result of some of this news that's coming in with regards to the investment in crush facilities and as a result of the um, <clears throat> what we believe is maybe a little bit more of a sustainability in uh, in this biofuel market so once again, it's uh, it's early days. Uh, there is a time lag, but nonetheless, your question is absolutely pertinent. As we see these trends, we have to make a decision: is it a trend or is it a fashion? 
And right now, we believe that things like the Invigor oil for food use uh, is, a, is an absolute trend. Invigor health for food use is a trend. And we can then certainly see that the biofuel market is a trend as well. There's a number of questions uh, coming from the, the audience watching this uh, the show today, asking Peter, okay, so increase in domestic crush capacity, I, I, I get it, I know where the oil's going. What the heck are we going to do with all this meal? The, is the dairy industry going to just take it all, or what are some of the other uses for the meal? Yeah, that's a that's a very good point. You're right. You can't get one without the other. When you when you crush, you create meal and you create oil. And right now, the the demand is well, there's there's strong demand for for both. But uh, you know, Ket, uh, Wes, you might have a little bit uh, better insight than I do regarding uh, your thoughts about that meal demand on the, in in Canada. Well, I think just looking at meal in North America, more generally. Um, there's a lot of discussion right now when we're looking at uh, crushing occurring because of the oil to get the oil about that very question, where is all the meal going to go? And then right away we start thinking about China and the idea that if we're gonna crush more in North America, um, you know, we've already seen that maybe the, the crush margins aren't as favorable in, 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 in China and possibly uh, we do get a dislocation in crush and the crush uh, shifts to North America and maybe China buys more meal. Uh, that's, a, that's a thought that people are, are considering and uh, that would also include canola because uh, canola meal goes into China and you've got to think about what's happening with aquaculture and, and different uses that way. Um, so for sure, uh, still going into California or different dairy markets in the U.S., but uh, at the same time, possibly more opportunity to go to China with the meal. Yeah, and and, and I mentioned the dairy. Is the, is the U.S. dairy industry still a pretty large user of uh, canola meal coming out of Canada West? Definitely. The, for both products, the oil and the meal, the two end users are China and the U.S., yes. Yeah, okay, so, okay. Cool. Uh, just looking here. Oh, there's a lot of questions coming in here now. Um, let's look here. Okay, uh, a lot of market questions, guys. You you got everybody thinking. Um, that's good. Uh, okay. Uh, do you see anything outside of S and D that could derail the canola prices, like things like macro events? So the flooding in BC obviously is a, is an example where there's disruptions that nobody anticipates and the second part of that is expanding on the fact that crushers margins aren't actually where it looks like they are can the crush keep going at this pace once they're actually having to buy a large percentage in this new pricing environment my the first thought on uh what can derail it uh, the unforeseen is like what did we you know look at prices in the past week any and uh, it ought, a lot of it has to do with uh the next, uh, you know, COVID variant that comes out and get and gives the market a scare about uh, those types of concerns. You know, the the downward, the all the commodity markets took a downward shift here in the past week, and it really had nothing to do with with uh, the the fundamental supply and demand outlook. Really didn't change at all. And so that those types of things, uh, you know, when you can get uh, when you get canola, you know, drop from uh, nineteen dollars a ton to a cheap seventeen dollars a ton in the uh, you know in the uh, in just a two week period. That's that's concerning. However, um, you know it's it's not extremely long lasting. We think things are settling out and might take a run back higher. But uh, uh, Wes, do you have additional thoughts on that? Well, I think when you're looking at the macro issues um, again, because of what I've been talking about um, with the ties uh, increasingly. Uh, between uh, energy, big energy, and uh, and ag, uh, we can see that the market for vegetable oils, particularly uh, soybean, U.S. soybean oil, and and also palm, but uh, really any of the, the vegetable oils, you can see that it's very closely tied to what happens with uh, energy pricing. Um, and you look at the movements in crude oil; it's come off, and that's a big reason why vegetable oil has had a little bit of a setback in the last few weeks. Um, so anything that's going to on the macro level influence uh, global uh, prices for energy. Uh, that's something to watch going forward. Wes, West, long term, is palm in trouble? Like, are we going to see palm usage kind of go down based on so much focus on sustainability? I know there's sustainable palm oil now, but uh, long term, what's that palm chart going to look like? 
Well, we were talking about the meal and the potential that, uh, you know, if the crush does uh, does move to, uh, you know, the biggest crusher is China. And if they do uh, end up buying more meal, uh, they're going to produce less soybean oil. And if they produce less soybean oil, maybe they're buying more palm. And we've already seen that. So. Okay. I just uh, wanted to add, uh, Sean, that uh, regarding, we know that uh, these, uh, these veg oils markets do follow crude oil energy markets quite a bit and uh, and we know that crude oil uh, futures have taken a drop from nearly eighty dollars down to sixty five sixty eight dollars but our our team is not bearish from current levels just to add that in that we think that uh, prices are crude oil prices are going to be sustained at levels higher than where we're currently trading let's get to the Canadian economy I like to hear that. Nice. And the the other thing to think about on the on the vegetables and to biofuels, I'm not talking about renewable diesel or sustainable aviation. It's biofuel, and I'm including biodiesel and biodiesel. You know, you got to think about Indonesia, and they're using palm oil, and that ties it to the energy as well. So um, it's important. It's it's very new. It's a bit nuanced, and it's a little hard some times to explain it and, and understand, but there's these distinctions. And, and when I'm talking about uh, sustainable aviation and renewable diesel, I'm really thinking now about Canada, the US and, and Europe, but there's and there's also biodiesel production going on around the world, whether it's in South yeah. America and, and uh, Southeast Asian countries as well. So, Janelle, there's a bunch of questions coming in from the audience about how potentially you're managing all the discussion about the supply disruptions. Um, whether it come, you know, fertilizer and crop protection products, seed. Have you been trying to get as much of this on farm as possible, or how are you managing it? Yeah, absolutely. So all my fertilizers on farm already. Um, a good portion of my chemicals already ordered, which is two months earlier than I typically do it. Um, you know, when you think about the equipment, you know, anything that's traded hasn't actually left the farm and won't leave the farm until the new piece arrives so that's that's what i've been doing taking into control what i can i know that doesn't guarantee anything but th those are the steps that we've been taking and um i i, I hope i'm hopeful that 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 will do it for me but yeah all my fertilizers on farm i have way more chemical on farm than i've ever overwintered and and those sorts of things have have been my approach to to managing the risk in that and, and taking control of it yeah, I think for a lot of farmers, it's been, I don't know, uncomfortable maybe the best word to use when it comes to the decision-making timeline. You, you just addressed it where I'm, I'm I'm ordering these crop protection products before maybe I typically would. And, you know, I, I hear from our audience lots, well, I don't know what weeds I have. How do I know what chemicals to order? Um, and this is a year where you kind of, you, you got to get ahead of it. And it, it may be uncomfortable and maybe out of routine, but you really got to do it, you know. Yeah, and, and that's what we've found, that we'll, we'll use what we know and what's worked good for us in the past and, and go with that and, and, and know that having something is better than nothing um, and that in season, I still think we'll be able to make some changes when, when and where we need to. Yeah, and, and Janelle, you, you mentioned partnerships a lot. You know, working a retailer, I'm assuming, is a part of that. Uh, outside help you're just trying to put all the package together and I'm trying to keep everybody on the same page talk, talk about that a little bit mm -hmm. so i i work with some great retails and I, I have some really good people in that regard that i work with and i'm i'm really pleased to to have them in my corner and we talk on a regular basis and you know they in a lot of cases were the ones that helped me get on side with this idea of having you know, whatever, whatever the product is in my shed and, and helping me uh, store it over winter for those products that I can't. And so those relationships have been just, just fundamental in making sure that I get what I want when I want it. And uh, I'm so thankful to work with such good people on that level. I mean, the same goes with my, my grain handling as well, that they, they work so closely with us and, and our equipment dealers too. So it, it's all of those people that you know, allow us to do what we do in, in, in the way that we do. Garth, there's a question here about IP programs. It comes from Garth. He farms in Southeast Saskatchewan. He says, with my IP programs, I grow for the question, uh, I grow for the questions have rotated from clearing. Uh, okay, hold on here. I'm going to skip it. There's a bit of a, a beginning here. Um, 
thanks for the comments regarding uh you know, do we deserve these prices? Will our productions eventually be seen as sustainable and be rewarded as such compared to practices around the globe that aren't necessarily as sustainable? Garth, do you have some comments on that? Yeah, that's uh, that's something that's really top of mind, and and I I immediately when I when I hear that, you know, go back to the to the discussions we actually had on the board of the Canola Council, and it's exactly that. Um, it's, uh, you know, that Canadian farmers by and large are doing a lot of really, really great things. We just don't have a way to talk about it, nor do we have a way to measure it. And, th and that's where I'm going to focus my answer on is that measuring the good things we are doing. And um, so I, once again, you know, this is going to be a partnership as we, as we go forward. And that is those growers that do all these good things, we've got to have a way of describing it and a way of measuring it. And uh, that, I believe, is going to be a distinction, uh, you know, on the on the world market. I I just mentioned that because I, I'm fortunate to also uh, be in charge of uh, BASF's cotton seed business. And in our cotton seed business, we've actually for a couple of years now we have a a sustainability program. <clears throat> it's called the E3 program. And actually, there we've managed to design a way of actually measuring and documenting the great things that the cotton farmers are doing. And it actually goes right the way through to the bale. The bale has a specific ID. And when the, when the mill purchase the, purchases the bale, they can actually reference to all of the great things that, we, that the grower did during the, during the growing season. So this is a great question in the sense that it's top of mind of the, of the Canola Council and of all the board members. The, the key is going to be how do we document it? How do we measure it? And how do we demonstrate that uh, Canadian growers are actually doing really, really good things for sustainability? And I believe, like in the cotton industry, uh, we can and we will be rewarded for that. It, Garth, it's not Garth, easy. Speak, yeah, it's not easy. And uh, speak to that cotton seed example. Has the have the uh, the clothing manufacturers been pretty accepting and like very very interested in some of the, that sustainability, the tracking down to the bale? Absolutely. I mean, on the one hand, the the clothing industry has has really cottoned onto this. The clothing industry has really bought into this and has used this uh, in their marketing um, as well. And uh, we know that some of the clothing items, like uh, there's some uh, there's some blue jeans that are selling almost a hundred dollars more than uh, than the regular ones and uh, because they have this uh, they're able to put this e3 sustainability mark on it and you know grown in the us and, and all the other really good things i guess the part that i'm a little um sad about is how do we get that some of that hundred dollars back to the grower and you know while i think it's been really really exciting to do the proof of concept that uh, the clothing manufacturers have been able to not only see the value, market the value, but actually have consumers pay more for the value. The, the question now is how do you get a little bit of that money back? Just a penny, a penny a jean would be great to get that back into the hands of the growers. But you've got to start somewhere. And, uh, and I think um, the, uh, the, the, the question that uh, is raised uh, is, a, is a catalyst, I believe, for our canola industry as well. Not only are we doing great things, but we know we're going to have the ability to describe what we put into the renewable fuel. The renewable fuel has a lot of criteria as, to what, as well as maybe some of the other uh, uh, canolas uh, in, the, in the industry as well. Yeah, Garth, we don't want Levi's just to pocket all the money, right? Well, I'm not going to mention any brand names. <laughs> oh, see what I did? That was pretty good. I, I'm proud of my job. <laughs> but they, uh, they certainly put some, uh, some money in their jeans, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Uh, question for Wes from the audience. While renewable diesel is looking up, what about corn ethanol? Will we see a major shift in acres in the U.S. crop from corn to soy? Hey, Wes, you're muted, but I can answer. I, I can jump under that. Yeah, and can sure, you? Peter, you're yeah. coming from that industry. Really, our uh, we are we put out our team our HS Marcus team has put out a projection for 2022 uh, planted area and and we are indeed expecting uh, corn acres to come down and soybean acres to to go up uh, we might even get back to a to uh, a level where approximately 90 million acres each could be could 
we're we're not there now. We're roughly about 91 million corn, 87 million soybeans. But uh, but there's a, there's this big assumption that you're gonna we're gonna have this big switch to soybeans away from corn. And like Janelle was saying, that when you make good decisions about getting maybe getting fertilizer booked early and making and locking in the revenue side with prices as high as they are, because uh, you know corn corn prices are are for forward contracting new crop corn for the 2022 year those those new crop prices are trading about a dollar 25 per bushel higher than if they were forward marketing a year ago so the revenue side is there it's but right now it does look like uh we're going to have a, a, a bit of a shift away from corn towards soybeans at this time so so peter just i don't want to get uh, i know a lot of our audience isn't necessarily growing corn but corn does drive the market yeah. Long term, how concerned are you about the RFS? There, we we saw, uh, you know, big time issues with what happened on these small refinery waivers uh, under the Trump administration. There's been challenges with ethanol policy under the Biden administration. This is just seems to be the thing that never goes away. Long term, what's the RFS look like to you? Yeah, you know, trying trying to get them to the government to give us their mandates, the numbers that, that they're gonna they're gonna. Re- mandate as far as the RFS is a bit of a challenge. We're, our long-term projections are are not making adjustments lower for ethanol usage for corn. We're, we're in fact uh, adjusting growth in that industry, continuing to expect that number to be higher. Right now at the moment, our, our projection for uh, corn use for ethanol in the U.S., uh, for for this marketing year that we're in, we're we're about 100 million bushels larger than what USDA is showing. So we have a bit we have optimism that that's going to continue to show be sustained at least at, at some pretty high levels, and it, we don't expect it to go away. Yeah, I just want to back up the truck here just really quick. Uh, a question from the audience, and it's it's worth going back to because I think it's an important distinction. What is the difference between biodiesel and renewable diesel? Well, I think the big difference is actually in the chemistry. It is a a product that can be, uh, I'm not gonna get into the chemistry, but it, whereas with biodiesel, you're, you, you're subject to uh, uh, limitations because of gelling, uh, which keeps you, uh having to blend it with with uh petroleum products in, in order to avoid uh gelling problems in cold cold climates but uh with renewable diesel it's a it can be re- used as a, a straight replacement for petroleum products and that makes it more desirable uh as far as uh meeting carbon and in, carbon uh intensity reduction uh, goals you can you can use it at a higher rate and it also is something that uh, energy companies are uh, embracing because they can produce it and retrofit to existing facilities and and produce this this type of fuel so it is very attractive to them especially when you factor in that they're being subsidized by uh, some of the state level uh, state level programs so as we go along with this we do anticipate that renewable diesel is, is going to somewhat ca- cannibalize what's happened with uh, biodiesel production in the U.S. Um, so, Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask, so Janelle, I'm going to ask Peter for a number and then I'm going to get your reaction to it. So Peter, uh, obviously canola has been a staple on the Western Canadian prairies. We, we do it very, very well. We've proven that we can grow over 20 million acres. We're seeing an increase in demand. There's going to be some interest in some of those U.S. states to grow canola, maybe again or for the first time. It could be springs, it could be winters, depending on which state you're in. Long term, where do you see this U.S. canola acre moving to? You know, we're not really we're not really ex- expecting a huge amount of growth with the current our current projection now that I'd thrown up there at uh, 800 800,000 uh, hectares. Um, we're not expecting huge growth. You know, you can imagine my hometown state of North Dakota, canola is near and dear to my heart, and we're going to continue to see a lot of uh, planted area up in that area. Uh, but we're not expecting a huge amount of growth other areas because, like Janelle said, there are other crops, and they're all and they've got some de- really decent payback. Uh, yield trends in corn and soybeans is are running higher continue to trend higher and so uh, we're 
leveling off at the current high number is our expectation. Even long term. Even long term. Wow. I, I had an analyst tell me one uh, going back probably four months ago on on this topic. He was thinking five million. That does that seem preposterous to you? Well, certainly not. Uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, uh, not preposterous at all. You know, it's hard. It's hard to. It's hard to project. Of course, moving out and and but everything will depend on like the this demand picture is uh is mm -hmm. is this demand going to be sustainable at these uh, that we're seeing right now? It looks pretty looks pretty optimistic right now. Yeah, and, and Janelle, I think this is the advantage for the Western Canadian farmer. There's a lot of crops in the rotation. There's a lot of possible crops in the rotation. When, when you talk to farmers in, say, Iowa, they only have they they only know two crops. It, it's corn or beans, and they sort of go back and forth. Western Canadian rotation could have I don't know seven, eight, nine different crops. Th this really is our advantage. Yeah, it is, and I don't know. That's why I'm so excited because you can grow oats and make lots of money this year. Barley, flax, you name it. The the prices of all those crops are good. So it's I don't know. I think that's what what makes this all lots of fun is that we get to do what each individual farm's good at and where our risk is and what we want to try, what our risk tolerance is. So I think that's why this is so much fun when everything is at a good price and and here we are getting to to capitalize on it. But, but Janelle, you, you mentioned the economic side of that. There's also the agronomic benefit too, right? Like, uh, yes, all there is, like we talked about, every crop in the Western Canadian prairie portfolio can make money this year. But there's also the agronomic value and benefit that comes from that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that it's an opportunity in some cases to give some some fields a break potentially and grow something something different on them. Uh, it's an opportunity, I, I think, for like I talked about some of the root rots that have, you know, are maybe being a challenge, giving a break there. Some of the insects, um, you know, just just trying different, you know, fertility options, different chemistries as well. When you think about herbicide resistance and and weed resistance, so that's that's also an opportunity to to play with that as well. But um, you're, you're going to find that I continue to talk about doing what you do well and and, and taking advantage of that. Hey, great stuff. We This has been fabulous. It's been 90 minutes of great information. We had some great questions from the audience. I want to thank all of our panelists today for participating, providing their perspective through their lens. Great, great insight today. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Our, Thanks, John. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. John. Our Appreciate goal is to, our goal is to provide you with information that helps you move your operation forward. We'd like to hear what you thought of today's webinar and would appreciate it if you could take a minute to answer the brief survey question. You'll see when you exit the webinar. It's not going to take very long. You know, just a, a few, like a minute maybe. And once again, for those of you who are certified crop advisors and or certified crop science consultants, you are eligible to receive one CEU credit for attending this webinar. If you're registered an earlier date and forgot to uh, put your number in, don't worry, just contact Ag Solutions Customer Care. Shortly after this webinar, you receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording, so you can watch it again. I might have to do that myself, some great market insight. We'll also post our questions and answers from the session today with the link provided. Keep your eyes on your inbox for that communication. For any additional questions that weren't answered today, talk to your trusted BSF Egg Solutions representative or call the Egg Solutions Customer Care at 877-371-2273 to learn more. Thanks again for attending. We wish you all the best in the coming season. Happy holidays. On behalf of BSF and myself, Sean Haney of Real Agriculture. Cheers, everybody. <music>